Hi everyone, this is Renata Gomidi with a new ideas for Divas videocast. So today we are talking to Edwin Zuluaga about how mindfulness can help your career. So he was a monk for four years before he joined his career at a major consulting firm. So I'm super excited to hear about his story. Uh, so first question that we ask to all guests, um, in Ideas for Divas, you define divas as authentic and trendsetters. So divas don't pay much attention to others' opinions and establish a standard. How do you identify yourself with this definition? Yeah, I, I love this question uh, and it's a great question. So if you go back when I first joined, when I first became a monk 2000, back in 2010, this concept was not something that was top of mind to a lot of folks, especially in my community. Um, I remember when I'd said, you know what, like this is the path I wanna pursue. This is my purpose, this is my meaning. There was a lot of rejection. So like, you know, are you crazy? You know, are you sure this is the, your way of life? You know, why don't you go to college, get a, get a normal job, nine to five. But during that time, I, I knew that I wanted to do more than just, you know, follow the, the common norm. So when I became a monk, uh, I felt like I was kind of creating my own path and being my true self of who I wanted to be at the moment. So I really resonate with, with what you just mentioned is how, you know, defining as a diva with it being authentic and, and the trendsetter. So, so yeah, that yeah, answer your question. That's definitely answer my question. I can't wait to hear about your story as a monk. So can you share a little bit in your transition from that phase to the business world? Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's always a fun question. So when I'm I'm very non-traditional, right, sort of person going into the workforce, especially now in uh, consulting for a large global firm. Before all this, I did not want to be a consultant. I thought that I was going to be a monk for the rest of my life. Um, but there's certain elements that I knew. So when I first, uh, so let me just backtrack a little bit, you know, how I became a monk and then why I decided to become a monk and then what led me to become a consultant after that. So during the year before I became a monk, I was struggling with my true self, really trying to figure out, you know, what is my purpose in life? You know, you know, I was living in Miami, Florida at the time, which is a large party culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a time where you have to sort of walk this ideal world where you have to show up in a way that the society wanted you to show up. And I was struggling and I, and I, and I saw a lot of poverty around me. I saw a lot of, um, you know, communities suffering from a lot of issues with uh, poverty, you know, lack of access to healthcare, and I wanted to do more than that. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've learned that there was a, a group of monks in New York, in the Bronx, New York, in the streets of it all, uh, serving the community, serving the poor. And so I, I, I went just for a come and see weekend just to check it out and see what they're all about. And they were doing just that. They were serving the communities, they were involved in the communities, uh, they rolled up their sleeves. And there was these guys from different parts of the world, different cultures, um, real as you can, as you can, you know, meet them. They were just real nature. They had, they lived their own in the worldly lives before. And so I was intrigued and I was motivated. And at that time I was, I was early twenties. I was like, you know what, this is what I want to do. I, I, you know, this is what I want to pursue. So I left the party life culture, Miami. I left all that behind and I wanted to pursue something uh, that was more meaningful to me um, because I felt like I was living my true authentic self. And so I spent four years with them and it was the best time of my life. I lived in California, um, serving the immigrant community in California, uh, worked in Delaware, lived in Philadelphia, New York, Kansas, been all over. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing experience working with different communities from the Jewish community, Muslim community, even from the Jamaican community up in New York. Um, at-risk youth, uh, women, single women and children and adolescents. So I, I worked with a variety of, of communities. And so uh, that really kind of opened up my eyes. Now, Renato, when you, when you asked me how did that transition over to the consulting world or to the business world, I knew this has happened during my fourth year as a monk. I was struggling. I was like, you know, I want to do more than just serve the community. Like there's a lot of issues <clears throat> excuse me, at, at the system level mm -hmm. that need to be addressed. We need leaders to, to guide. And I found myself working with a lot of local representative governors in Delaware and mayors. And 
I, I you know we had f fancy dinners. We you know in terms of being able to influence them to to make decisions for the community. And I felt like as a monk, you're restricted. There's not a lot of things you can do as a monk. You have to follow the certain rules and regulations. And I knew that I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to mm -hmm. step into the world and make more business uh, decisions. And as a monk, you can't do that. Just three type of vows you have to take, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And I can get into that another topic uh, in another um, discussion. But mm -hmm. I remember that I was, I was struggling because I wanted to do more for the community and I couldn't do it as a monk there was certain restrictions. So when I decided to leave and I made that decision to leave, I knew that I wanted to pursue a career that can make a difference and an impact in the communities. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> at the time it wasn't business. At the time was social work. I, you know, one of our great global leads in our consulting firm has a social work background and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, she, um, she, you know, her, her experience in social work in terms of the human element, human social impact, I was intrigued by that. And so I pursued a degree in social work, got involved in social work, but I, I took it in the lens at a macro level. So more at the mm -hmm. system approach. And at that moment, we were so good at under understanding the problem and identifying the problem. We were so good at so, uh, solutioning and, and finding the solutions. And so I started networking with a lot of business folks in the business world and they said, hey, Edwin, I think you'd be really good at consulting. You know, what you're doing is what we do in consulting world. You know, you problem solve, you meet, with, you meet people where they're at, you identify the, the problems and, and really help them find a solution. You'd be really good at consulting. But at the time, I was very biased because I felt like, well, in consulting, you know, it's all about money. It's all about uh, this and that. And mm -hmm. I, I just had really false pre, I, I guess, assumptions of what that really was. Um, but I had a couple of colleagues who were in this space and they said, no, not at all. Here's what it is. And here's how we're making an impact in the community, not only from a business aspect, but also from uh, the, the social impact. Mm -hmm. And that really sold me, Renata. And so I started pursuing that. I got into some consulting gigs uh, growing you know, into my career, um, was internal client facing consultant in healthcare, nonprofits for a couple of years. And then it's where I landed my role now at Accenture uh, as a, you know, in this global firm, serving a lot of com uh, major projects. And I'm excited about that. But again, it all goes back to how do we make sure that we bring that impact to our, and to our customers, to our, you know, and the, to the community. So I, I do see the full circle kind of closing in of, of mm -hmm. what I've learned as a monk and how I carried over to the consulting world. Yeah, so now we are trying to make more impact at scale. What it's amazing. So uh, tell me a little bit more about what you learned as a monk that actually helps your career uh, at this global <laughs> consulting question. firm. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that is a great question. So as a monk, there's certain things you learn. Uh, so if I take myself back when I first, kind of like an adolescence per se, right? And, uh, as a novice, um, you there's a couple of things you pick up. One is, you meet people where they're at, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, uh, religion backgrounds, you are serving the, the human as a whole. And so you become thinking more of that human centered approach. How do we individualize the people that we're serving so we can give our true selves and our full selves 100% to that person. And as a monk, you, you start thinking, becoming, you become more mindful in, in that way of thinking when you're serving a variety of communities, whether it's you know, uh, at-risk youth, whether it's a homeless person, a per person who doesn't have a home all the way to like, you know, the vice president of a bank institution or the governor or the representative. And so you start really being able to work through diverse sort of uh, groups and it helps you become more self-aware of your own assumptions, biases, self-perceptions, and then you can kind of show up better to whoever you're meeting with. And so as a monk, you become more mindful on Every person that you meet, you're very intentional and, and you're very purposeful, which is remembering their name, um, mm -hmm. understanding their, their cultural norms, and be able to reciprocate that. Um, so when you do show up, they feel welcomed, they feel a sense of belonging in the space that you're bringing, and, and that builds trust very fast. And as a monk, you're, you're learning those things very fast, and, and, and they kind of train you to, to be that way because you're always in the community, you're always mm -hmm. serving different communities. There's a saying that when you are in a community for 
for more than two years and you're feeling comfortable and excited, they move you to another community because they don't want you to get too comfortable and they mm -hmm. want you to keep expanding your, your awareness. So that is one aspect as a monk that you, you really pick up. I think another one that I think resonates with this conversation is around meditation and mindfulness, mm -hmm. which really connects with becoming emotionally intelligent. And I know there's a lot of conversations about the EQ and being emotionally self-aware. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're able to meditate, pause, and really slow the monkeys in your brain in a way where it starts resonating, where you start seeing, why am I always thinking about this throughout the day? You know, and, and you start really understanding throughout the process of your own day-to-day, -day, your mind starts to slow down <clears throat> and you start becoming more self-aware of your own actions throughout the day. Mm -hmm. You know, whether someone made you angry throughout the day or someone cut you off in the car, how did you react to that? Or someone gave you a bad look you know, not for you not to take it personally, it's like all those little things throughout the day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. You know, when you're able to meditate throughout the day and you're, re you're able to recollect all those thoughts, then you're able to, to become more self-aware of yourself. Mm -hmm. You're able to <clears throat> reflect more on how you show up. And then in return, you're able to then treat others in a way that you're not bringing, you're not projecting your emotions or your stresses on other people. So you're, you're, be, <clears throat> you're being self-aware of yourself, of others, and then you can manage those emotions when you meet with people. So, excuse me, I, I think I was drift, drinking coffee before this, so my throat mm -hmm. is a little graspy <laughs> at times. No worries. Yeah, I, I really like what you were saying about actually understanding the others, because I think that mindfulness was something that I was expecting that monks do, but I think that you just brought up something that was kind of new uh, and it's it's valuable in any field that you go. And I think that what happens a lot is that people don't listen. They don't pay attention to the other part. They are so eager to exactly. talk and yeah. to show how brilliant they are. And they don't, <laughs> they don't have this awareness. And I think that what you are saying, it's so important to really understand people where they are. Because that's how you understand their problems and how you can solve their problems. Exactly. Being in the community, being the business problem, et cetera. So... I love that. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly on that. You know, when you're trying to solve complex issues, if you're not really present in the, move, in the, in the, in the room as a whole, you're, you're missing out on, on, on that opportunity with the client. And mm -hmm. I think being practicing mindfulness, whether it's meditating, whether it's, you know, taking time for yourself to really recollect your thoughts, your assumptions, your biases, if you don't do that throughout the day, it's really hard to then show up when you're meeting with someone or with, for example, for my case, as a consultant, you know, when I'm meeting with a client. And so that does help. So the, the monk life did kind of help shape me in terms of how I show up to, to clients, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I can imagine how that helps you. So let's talk about mindfulness. I think when you mentioned that you started in 2010, it just brought me back to what I was doing in 2010. It was the first time that I actually... I heard about meditation. I was going through a very stressful moment in my life and someone told me like, why don't you try meditation? And I didn't know what that was. There, wasn't, there were no resources available. I thought that was complicated and something that I didn't have time for. That is like, oh, you have to go take a class and learn and whatnot. So nowadays we have the apps, what I've been using, but I always feel that that's not enough, etc. So I'd love to get your suggestions uh, like for someone who's really trying to build some of this uh, meditation mindfulness practice, but either have challenge to create the habit or have challenge when trying to do it and feeling that the result is not there or like that you can't really sit still. So talking to all the other people, <laughs> including myself, who is trying to you really know, this, this, this is a, this, habit. Yeah, this is a fun, <laughs> Fun, this is a fun topic. Um, mm -hmm. The reason why I say this is because mindfulness is now a hot topic nowadays. I feel like if you're not incorporating mindfulness into your daily life, whether at work or at home, you feel like you're missing out on society. You feel like you're missing out on like that hot topic, right? Of like, mm -hmm. I'm not being good enough. The first thing that comes to mind when I first, when I, when I joined as a monk and now post monk life, we're human at the end of the day and you have to give grace to yourself.
-hmm. when, when I started practicing mindfulness back in 2007, whether it's meditation, whether it's sitting still, whether it's putting, um, you know, mantra music or meditation music to really settle in and, 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 you know, uh, what is it? This phrase that I've heard, heard a lot of times is slow the monkeys in the brain. Oh, yeah. You have to give your, yourself grace because in the, the day you're human. <clears throat> this is a work in progress. Um, this is not something that you wake up one day and you have it figured out. You know, I remember when I, when I was meditating five to 10, 15 minutes a day pre monk life. And when I became a monk, we were required to meditate two hours a day, uh, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. Um, and it was all together in the chapel. And I remember when I first started this, I was freaking out because I was million the thoughts coming through. Mm -hmm. I was falling asleep. I was getting distracted. And I was so frustrated with myself because I'm like, I feel like I'm not there. These, these guys are pros. These guys are meditating. They're sitting still. They're very collective. And an old monk who he was probably in his 70s or he, almost 80s, he once told me, he said, you know, we all have a unique journey um, to reach this, this end state of, of true mindfulness where we feel like we're we're there, but we'll, we'll we'll, we will never get there. This is just a, a long journey progress. And so I always give people advice to start small. You know, don't, with the goal, you know, I'm going to start meditating for an hour, or two hours, just five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. I think Gandhi once said, if, if everybody, Gandhi said, if everybody meditates for five minutes a day, we'll be in a better place, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that's all it takes, you know, starting small. Uh, one of the things that really helped me is having a, <clears throat> a social support. Um, so when you when you're practicing mindfulness, incorporate others. Uh, so you're, you're not doing this alone. And I think that helps uh, building that social support. So you because when I was a monk, it was 20 of us in a room and we we're meditating in a chapel together. And that kind of really helps kind of harmonize the approach because again, you realize that we're all in this together, you know, we're, we're trying to build and, and you have those sort of uh, self reflections or journaling or, or just moments of of sharing with others how you felt through that time when you meditated and so forth. Um, and another is uh, building positive reinforcements for yourself. So like if you mm -hmm. were able to meditate 10 minutes, you know, that's amazing. You know, congratulate yourself, you, you know, you show, uh, your, your hands on the back and, and say you did a great job. But I think for me, it's going back to knowing that you're human first. You're not going to be successful meditating for an hour, day, you know, and, and I always tell people this meditation is very different. It comes in many different forms. And I'm sure mm -hmm. others can probably debate, can debate with me on this, but it doesn't have to be sitting down um, and just sitting still. Being mindful can also be in, in your work, in your day-to-day -day life, uh, when you go mm -hmm. shopping, when you're driving, when you're eating. For example, when you're eating, are you on your phone? Are you think you're watching mm -hmm. TV? You know, just being present and eating uh, and, and focusing just on your meal is a, is, a, is a way of also practicing meditation and mindfulness. When you're in the car driving, are you constantly listening to music or podcasts or thinking about other things or just driving? Sometimes, have you ever, do you ever imagine when you're driving and you got to your house from work and you realize, I don't remember how I drove from work to my house. You're just, you're just not conscious about those things, right? Yep. Um, and so that's also ways of practicing mindfulness. Or when you're talking to your spouse or your partner and your loved, or your loved one, are you fully present in the moment listening to what they're saying? Or you're already thinking about what to say ahead of time? Yep. And so... To me, those are all practices of mindfulness and starting there, I think it really helps, not just getting on a chair and sitting down and just being quiet because at the end of the day, you're always gonna hear a lot of noises in the, in the background. And so there's different ways of being mindful and, and practicing mindfulness. So I hope that answered your question, Renata. That's, that's very helpful. Um, just out of curiosity, how long do you meditate <laughs> nowadays? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't wear the brown robe anymore and I don't, and I don't have the, the, <laughs> the monk life anymore. I'll be very honest. I going back to give myself grace when I was a monk, you, you know, we were meditating two hours a day mm. post monk life. You know, I got married. I have two dogs. I have a life. I'm a consultant, you know? So like, mm -hmm. it's really difficult nowadays to, to practice that because you're just not in that environment anymore. Um, so now I would say 10 minutes, if at all, a day, you know, mm -hmm. and you may think, but how is that possible when you were for four years, you would probably at least be able to, to guess a good habit. And to be honest with you, I'll be very transparent. You know, we go through 
through stages in life where we're doing, we feel like we're doing good. And then we just, there's moments where we just have to give ourselves grace that right now in this time of journey of, in my own journey of mindfulness, I am not there and I have to kind of get back to that. It's always easy to go down the hill of any situation in your life. And, and, but it's always hard to go back up the hill. But once you're up the hill, you can see the horizon view of, 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 mm -hmm. of where you, you accomplished. And that's, that's such an amazing feeling. And so for me in my own life right now, at the moment, I'm at the down of the hill trying to climb back up of the hill where I used to be as a monk. So I just full transparency is just, it's something that I wish I can go back and habit in uh, mm -hmm. to start practicing. Um, but those things are always there, you know, and I, I think for me, instead of meditating, I'm, I'm definitely making sure that I'm being mindful when I'm eating with my mm -hmm. partner or when, when I'm meeting with a client or when, if I'm meeting with a friend or a loved one that I'm present. And I think that to me is the start of it all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, all about bringing the kindness to yourself. Sometimes we are the hardest on ourselves than anybody else. I think that exactly. you mentioned that multiple yeah. times. And I think that we just need to be just graceful and just give ourselves some kindness too. So we can continue to our journey, continue to grow. So thank you, Edwin. 100%. That was amazing. Uh, learned a lot. Amazing journey. Thanks for sharing with us and for those listening. Yeah, thanks to for you. having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the listeners of Ideas for Divas, uh, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel and subscribe to our blog so you can get our posts early on. Thank you.